Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC308. Um, thank you for connecting to the class today. Let's pray and get started. Maybe somebody could lead us in prayer, please, and we'll get started. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. Thank you for the class that you have given us. Uh, and Lord, I thank you for uh, revealing the things to us, Jesus. You considered us worthy enough uh, that we could know this, we could understand your will, your plans, and, and the future, what it holds, so we can be uh, people of hope, Jesus. And God, I pray that as we uh, see the prophecies and try to understand them, God, I pray that Jesus, you will, uh, Holy Spirit, you will guide us, reveal us the deepest truth, and uh, fill us with your hope, Jesus, fill us with your word, so that uh, we can go out, uh, preach the gospel boldly so that the people who are hopeless will be filled with hope. We thank you for your words. We thank you for Pastor Ashish. And I thank you for all my classmates. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Thank you. So um, before we move forward, I mean, we, have, we are in now in the book of Daniel. Uh, we're coming close to the end of the book. We have uh, chapters 11 and 12 that we plan to complete today. Um, before we move forward, I just want to see if there's any questions from anybody in the class on what we have covered so far up to Daniel 9. Uh, any questions? Was uh, I know last week we went through Daniel 9, and uh, uh, if you went back and thought about it and uh, did you have any questions did you have did you want any clarifications uh anybody anything you wanted explained um if you don't we'll move forward okay so um, let's move forward. And of course, you're always welcome to uh, pick up any question at any time. So we covered till chapter 9. Uh, in chapter 10, the, uh, we're not going to go into chapter 10, but uh, the, uh, uh, in chapter 10, Angel Gabriel is explaining to Daniel uh, what is happening in the spiritual realm. Uh, he has brought a message to Daniel, but he says, Daniel, uh, you know, when I was about to come and give you this message, uh, there was a spiritual battle. There were things happening, uh, and Daniel is, uh, you know, uh, uh, he, he was uh, in prayer for 21 days. Uh, and uh, so uh, Gabriel ex explains about what's hap what happened or, and what is going to happen in the spiritual realm, basically. Uh, we understand through what we see in chapter 10 uh, that there are rulers or spiritual powers uh, over geographical regions. Um, chapter 10 refers to as the prince of Greece, Persia, the prince of Israel, which is Michael, the archangel assigned to Israel, the demonic powers over Persia, that's Iran, over Greece, and how they were trying to intercept and interrupt Gabriel from coming through, and how Michael the Archangel uh, assisted uh, Gabriel, and uh, he was expecting the same to happen on his way back. And um, uh, uh, I just want to point to verse 14 of Daniel 10. Uh, Daniel 10, verse 14, where uh, Gabriel says, Daniel 10, 14, I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. So uh, Gabriel says, you know, I've, I'm here to help you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. Okay? So that was one of the uh, key things we saw in chapter 9 when uh, Daniel 70th, uh, Daniel uh, the, the, the 70 weeks that Gabriel spoke about to Daniel in chapter 9 had to do with your people and your city. 
right? That means the Jewish people, the city of Jerusalem. That's repeated here in Daniel 10, 14. To your people, I mean, this is very specifically to your people, in the latter days, um, that is, uh, he's come to speak to Daniel about things about the end, the latter days, things in the end. So for the vision refers to many days. So with that background, so we're not going through chapter 10 because uh, it's more of a, 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 a uh, an insight into the spiritual realm and what's, what's hap what was happening at that moment. We are now going to go into chapter 11. Now, chapter 11 is a very uh, uh, interesting chapter because there are two portions to it. Uh, there is the portion which we would refer to as the near-term prophecy. That means something that would happen within the couple of next couple of hundred years, next couple of hundred years. That's the near term, and then there is the prophecy that would be uh, about the latter days. The latter days. Okay? So, uh, chapter ten, chapter eleven can be broken into these two parts. Right? So I'll just go ahead and share the notes, and I've, uh, I've put this in the notes. Right? So chapter 11, in your notes, um, chapter 11 verses um, till verse 39, 36, till verse 36, or let's say verse 35 on. Uh, till verse 35 is what we would refer to as the near term, the near term. And then we see what we would put as the long term, meaning something that's going to happen in the latter times. Okay. So, uh, and, and we will see, and we will see. Uh, uh, now, we're not going to read chapter 11, now verse by verse. Uh, but I will, I'll just I'll give you a summary. So basically, in chapter 11, till verse 35, verse 1 to 35, um, Daniel is going through the, the events that are going from the Medo-Persian, the Greeks, and then all the way to what will happen as enemies from the north and from the south fight. So the north, referring to Syria, and the south referring to Egypt. So Israel as a land is, is sandwiched between the Syria in the north and Egypt in the south. So he he focuses on, on what, what happens between Egypt, um, uh, Egypt in the south and Syria in the north. He focuses on what happens between these rulers uh, over the next several hundred years in, in the coming time. So near term, right? And, uh, Historically, when historians look back at what Daniel has written uh, here, verses 1 to 35, and compare it with the actual events of history, they're able to map it so beautifully. Right? And what's amazing is that in this little passage, right, uh, and I just put it down here at the beginning, 135 events are foretold about 200 years before they actually happen. So in this piece of text, Daniel 11, 1 to 35, numerous details, and somebody has counted it, I didn't count it, and somebody has counted it and arrived at this, 135 events. Foretold, prophesied, 200 years before they occur. So it's near term, meaning it was a few hundred years from then, but it was in detail. So what do we see, uh, uh, you know, versus, and I, I'll just go through this as an overview, uh, because it's a lot of history and, you know, uh, uh, kings and so on, which we are not familiar with, but people who study history, uh, they, they are able to map it, that what Daniel has written and what actually happened. But just giving us an overview. Okay. So Daniel 11 verses 1 to 4, uh, uh, he speaks about 
the Medo Persians, the Medes and the Persians. So he talks about three more kings arising, and uh, who's a king who's going to um, uh, from the Medes and the Persians, and then he talks about Alexander the Great, who was three, a mighty king will arise and rule with great dominion. Uh, you know, he's of course some of this he has already given to us in uh, chapter eight, but it's like a summary of all that he's given. Of verses three and four, he talks about the Greeks, and he talks about the four generals who would arise and uh, and and rule. Um, then from verses five to thirty-two is about Egypt in the south and Syria in the north, and all the kings would come one after the other. So it's literally, um, you know, uh, talking about if the kings would come from the south and the kings would come from the north, the Syrians. And so here I've just given between verses five, uh, six, and so on, you know, uh, these people, uh, people whom Daniel is referred to can be mapped to actual history and these names have been put down. So again, uh, it's people who know, who studied uh, ancient history, who are able to uh, you know, map it beautifully uh, for us. Uh, so I've been not going into these particular details because uh, these are historic and they've already happened. And, uh, uh, and you know we can read about these people and actually uh, the wonderful thing is, not, not necessarily wonderful, but the fact is that these people actually did what everything that Daniel said they would do. And some of it was very harsh against Israel, uh, especially uh, uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He was a very harsh king uh, who uh, really ill-treated the Jewish people, uh, Israel. But Daniel foretold that. Uh, in Daniel 11, 21 to 32. And he did exactly the things that Daniel foretold. So he was a very, very despicable enemy, a very harsh enemy, and he did exactly that. But what is of interest to us is what we pick up from uh, verse, verses 36 onwards, um, which we can map or we can you know, draw a parallel to some of the things that have been spoken in the past in chapter seven, eight, and nine, and which we can also, when we look uh, into Revelation, we can understand some of these things. So we will just pick up that portion from verse 36 on Daniel chapter 11, verses 36 to 45, and, um, and uh, let us look into that, please. Daniel 11, 36 to 45. Uh, we'll do the, the, the usual thing, maybe three verses each. Uh, just quickly read that, and we'll come back and analyze it closely. Daniel 11, 36 to 45. Verse 36. Then the king shall do according to his own will, he shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the god of this fathers, of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a god of fortresses and a god which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Verse 14 on. At the time, the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. 
he shall also enter the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown but these shall escape from his hand adam moab and the prominent people of ammon he shall stretch out yeah, go ahead uh, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of egypt shall not escape he shall not he shall have, he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of egypt also the libyans and the ethiopians shall follow at his heels but news from the east and the north shall trouble him therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many and he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glories and glorious holy mountain yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him hmm okay now uh, verse 35 if you look at verse 35 um um he's talking about you know whatever is happening will happen and uh, until the time of the end because it is still for the appointed time that means there is a transition right from we said from verse chapter 11 verses 1 to 35 is about near term uh, uh, the kings would happen and within a few hundred years all these things and verse 35 ends by saying okay now we are going to the time of the end that means we are now going to talk about the time of you know that's in the latter days remember we read in daniel chapter 10 verse 14 gabriel said i've come to talk to you about your people and the things which will happen in the latter times things that are out in the future so chapter 11 1 to 35 is near term which happened in a few hundred years but then verse 35 says okay until the time of the end because it is still for the appointed time now the move the shift is okay i'm now taking you to the time of the end for that future time and then he says he's talking about a particular king and basically verse 36 to 45 is about this particular king and as he introduces this particular king he is you know we can immediately recognize because he is speaking he's magnifying himself above every god he's speaking blasphemies against the god of gods and he's prospering i mean god is letting him prosper okay so immediately we connect back to hey this is familiar to us because he has described someone like this in chapter 7 and chapter 8 and chapter 9 whom we refer to or we recognize connecting it back to the book of, get, connecting it to the book of revelation in new testament scripture uh, as the antichrist so this man this king or a ruler or a leader is speaking blasphemies against god and another interesting thing as we uh, read is uh, uh, you know he says in verse verse uh, 36 he's speaking blasphemies god he will prosper till the wrath has been accomplished meaning the judgment of god has been accomplished he's got god is going to let him go let him do what he wants verse 37 he's not going to regard you know going to regard the god of his fathers i mean is is paying no respect to any known god on god known god not going to regard any god he's going to exalt himself above all of that and he's going to put his trust in and some unknown god so when we read very clearly in revelation 12 and 13 we read about this dragon who actually empowers the antichrist and the false prophet this this god with a small g uh, the god of this world who is empowering so the antichrist and the false prophet are actually directly empowered by satan this dragon in revelation 12 is uh, the satan the satan so we see here 
back in, uh, in Daniel 11, 37. He is going to honor a God which his fathers did not know. And he's going to, uh, he's going to be empowered by this God, this unknown God. And he's going to rule and uh, reign over many. And notice he's going to divide the land for gain. So divide the land for gain. What land is he talking about? There's only one land which is being the focus of all of this prophetic scripture. It's the land of Israel, the glorious land. And he's going to divide the land for gain. That means if we put it down in what, what we are seeing today in Israel, uh, the common uh, idea is that, okay, in order to have peace, we have to divide the land. Give the portions off to the Palestinians and Israel, you stay in this portion, give the other portions of the white the land. And this man, the antique prize, it says here, he's going to divide the land for gain. Verse 39, end of verse 39. So I'm trying to put all the pieces together, which is he's going to be able to have a temple built, which we know is the third temple. It has to be in place. But most likely his strategy will be, I will divide the land, but you give this. So he's pleasing both sides. He's able to please the Jews initially, but they get a temple. He's able to please the Palestinians, you get your land. And he is able to rule over many. He's able to have influence over many people. So I'm just putting the pieces together, right? Because we know that there has to be a temple and having a temple is going to make the Jewish people very happy. But we also know that this man, this king is going to divide the land, which is going to make the Palestinians and the Arabs very happy. So he comes as a man of peace. And this is most likely going to be his strategy for his peace treaty. I can make both sides happy if you give both sides what they want. Give the Jewish people the temple, give the Arabs their land, the land they want. Okay, so he can divide the land for gain, but what will he get? He will be able to rule over many. That's what he wants. And he's being empowered by this unknown God, this God whom none of his fathers knew, none of them worshipped. But he's speaking blasphemies against God and so on. Then what is happening, verses 40 to 45, is this. So remember, south is Egypt, north is Syria. He has done all this, but it says suddenly there's going to be a disturbance. From the south and from the north, they're going to attack. Meaning somehow these, this most likely will happen when he sets himself up as God. Hey, you came as a man of peace. You made us all happy. But in the middle of the seven years, you're breaking the covenant. And uh, you're setting yourself up as God. And you're setting, you're telling everybody to worship you. Something is wrong. Right? So there's that, that whole trust. The, 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 the whole peace treaty is broken. It doesn't last seven years. Three and a half years, it's broken. And so he's going to be attacked from the north and the south, from the south and the north, that is from Egypt and Syria. And it says here, verse 41, he shall enter the glorious land, that is the, the land of God's people. Many countries will be overthrown. I mean, it's, 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 this is like the picture of the Battle of Armageddon, right? Nations arising, coming together. Uh, uh, some will escape, some, uh, the Edom, the Moabites, the Ammon, um, they will escape. He will stretch his hand against many countries, uh, uh, doing all of this. But verse 44, but news from the east and the north shall trouble him. So this ties in so clearly to what we see in Revelation 19. Or actually, in Revelation 16, the river Euphrates dries up. 
and the kings of the earth, the kings of the east, are marching towards Jerusalem. So uh, just to give you that reference, if you turn with me to Revelation 16, I'll give you the exact verse. Right. Um, verse 12, Revelation 16, 12. Read what uh, uh, Revelation 16, 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So kings from the east, the rulers, the leaves from the east are moving in. Revelation 16, 12. This is the end, end of the judgments. What's happening? This is the build-up for the battle of Armageddon. What's happening? Kings from the east, armies from the east are moving in towards Jerusalem, the glorious land. What did Daniel say? If you go back to Daniel, chapter 11, verse 44. But news from the east and the north shall trouble up. North, Russia is coming in. Syria is there, the immediate north. Further up north, Russia. Russia is moving in. From the east, armies are moving in. They will come with great fury and just annihilate many. So this destruction um, that we see here, the ga gathering together at the Battle of Armageddon is going to be devastating. But this is like the final, the final buildup. Uh, the armies are moving in. And uh, he's going to try, uh, he's going to establish his, his own palace, verse 45 or, uh, of uh, Daniel 11. He's going to establish himself um, uh, between the sea and the glorious holy mountain at Jerusalem. He's going to put himself up there. But he's going to come to his end. Nobody will help him. So there are additional details given here, verses 36 to 45 of Daniel 11, about the Antichrist, what he's going to do, and how he's going to position himself, how he's going to you know, be able to exert influence over many nations, and what will finally happen. He'll be attacked from the south and the north. But what would be most devastating is when the kings of the east start moving in, that's his end. That means that's the battle of Armageddon, which we see in Revelation 16. Kings of the east are moving in. That's the final battle. Okay. So uh, let me just say, I see it. Um, John's asking question. So would this dividing of the land becoming the rule of many happen before the rapture? So this will happen right after the rapture. The reason is, remember we saw in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, that he who restrains must be taken out of the way, and then the son of the man of sin, the son of perdition, will be revealed. So that means the church is taken out of the way, only then this son of perdition is revealed. That means he Antichrist comes in to you know do his thing. So the church is taken out of the way, then he's revealed, and then, then begins the final the seven years. And what we have just read in Daniel 11, 44, 45 is the end of the seven years, which maps to Revelation 16, 12 on, which is the build up for the battle of Armageddon. Is that? Clear? Is that okay? Now, I, I, we didn't read, you know, verses chapter eleven, verse one to thirty-five, because it's all about those kings that 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 you know that that came in the few hundred years right after Daniel. Uh, it's too many details, uh, and the names are given. People have identified them, but this, this is the interesting part. Verses thirty-six to forty-five. Um, so, no. Pastor, one more doubt. Yes. Um, so, we, we see um, verse 44, the news from the east and the north shall trouble him. So, which means the king of the east and king of the north, as we mentioned, uh, Russia and the king of the east, would uh, cause trouble to the Antichrist, correct? Yeah, they're all moving... They're all moving towards the land of Israel, the battle of Armageddon. So uh, they are, in a sense, 
uh, and we will see this in Revelation um, 17. What happens is that in Revelation 17, we see that this whole religious system that was introduced by the false prophet, which who was supporting the Antichrist, he was beginning everybody to worship the beast, um, the false prophet. That loses suddenly loses support. People are disillusioned, and that begins the fall of the Antichrist. Meaning, like, okay, people are no longer trusting this man, and uh, everything is gone. And there's a big battle uh, coming in. So these armies are moving towards the glorious land. Now, uh, uh, verse 44 of Daniel 11, 44 and 45, they're coming. Uh, and how this battle is going to you know, play out, uh, we don't know exactly sure. We just know that all the armies are coming towards Israel to attack Israel. And at that time, the Lord Jesus returns. So that's 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 kind of the details we know. And we will look. Uh, we can look at um, when we we talk about the battle of Armageddon. Uh, we will look in detail on Ezekiel 30, 36, where we read about the North, the King of the North. If you want to look at it very quickly, you can. I'll just point it out to you. Uh, sorry, Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 describes this. Uh, Ezekiel 38, he says, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me. I'm reading from verse 1 on Ezekiel 38. Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against them. Thus says the Lord God, we will against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, I'll turn you around, put my hooks in your jaws, and lead you out by all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company, with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are all with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma from the far north, all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies, that I gathered about you and be a God. And then he says, after many days, you'll be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations. Now all of them will dwell safely. You will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. So Ezekiel 38, verse 1 to 9, is describing the build-up towards the Battle of Armageddon. And the, the tribes that are mentioned here, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, are tribes that are currently in Russia. He mentions in verse 5, Persia, which is Iran, Ethiopia, Libya. And then he also mentions Tugarma, which is Turkey, modern-day Turkey. That means all these Try or these nations are joining together, coming in from the north, moving in to attack the land, the mountains of Israel, the land of Israel. So this, uh, you know, Ezekiel 38 is basically uh, uh, detailing uh, how it's going to happen. And he mentions here that it will happen in, uh, in the latter years, verse 8. In the latter years, you will come into the land. Right. So this is happening in the latter years. Uh, they are attacking. So it kind of ties in with what we saw here in Daniel 11, 45, 46. Yes. Uh, but one more question. So the Antichrist, which uh, comes in, so just out of curiosity, is it a, a form of Satan or like a human being itself, like a normal man? Mm. Uh, or is he like influenced by Satan? He will be a normal man, uh, just like all any one of us, a normal man, but empowered by Satan. Similarly, the false prophet, we will read about him in Revelation 13. So there's going to be like another person who will be side by side with the Antichrist. The Bible refers to him in Revelation as the false prophet. 
He will also be another man, but he's empowered by Satan doing science and order. So basically, these are two human beings empowered by the by Satan, by the end, by the devil. Yes, Master. Thank you. Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just want some explanation for a few terms over here. Uh, I think in verse 36 it says, God of gods. Is it Jesus, the Father God? Uh, and also in verse 38 it says, a God of fortresses. And in verse 39 it says, the strongest fortress. And what are all these? I just want to know. Mm. Okay. Um, You're muted first. Sorry. Sorry. Um, here, verse 36, he will speak blasphemies against the God of gods. So God of gods is the most high God. Uh, so in our minds, when we say God, we should um, think of the Godhead. That means God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Godhead. Yeah? Uh, the, the triune God. So when we hear in the phrase, the God of gods, we are thinking about the triune God, the God of the Bible, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit together. Then um, verse 38, uh, um, it talks about he will honor a God of fortresses. And he will honor a God of fortresses and a God which his fathers did not know. So I'm not sure why, you know, that phrase, a God of fortresses is used. Maybe I'll have to uh, search on, on that. But a, a God which his fathers did not know is like this unknown God. What we can say based on Revelation 13 very clearly is that this man, is like Satan's main representative on the earth, the dragon. Uh, we'll read Revelation 12 13. So the dragon is empowering this man. And so, and he is getting people to worship him, the Antichrist, and actually through him, they're worshiping Satan. So uh, that's why I was saying that. A, a God which his fathers did not know. Uh, I, I take it from me, in, you know, in my understanding, I take it as representing the dragon, Satan himself. You know, that this is whom he is empowered by and whom he worships and he's fully committed to and is empowered. So I say that based on, you know, what we read in, in the New Testament. Um, and he will act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god, which he will acknowledge. Uh, so against, meaning against whatever defense. I mean, if you want to imagine uh, fortresses as in uh, defense, the strongest. That means no matter which, which country has what defense, uh, this man will act against it, empowered by this foreign god, this unknown god, empowered by Satan. I mean, Satan is empowering him to have great influence, uh, great, you know, uh, you could say strength or great power. Uh, and and God is allowing that for a season, for that seven years. It's okay, you know, that's I'm allowing that to happen during that seven year period. And therefore, this man is going to have rule and influence over many people. Uh, just have a follow up question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think this term, God of God, is, I, I, I don't know the name somewhere it is as well. I don't know where I've read it. But usually, uh, I mean, they, they can just read the God, like, because it's only from God. Like, even though it's a giant only one word. And uh, sometimes it creates a, like, I remember the last time when I went uh, one of my teachers or someone called and asked, there are some places where they say, he's the God of God. 
yes, it means they must know their God as well. And uh, uh, the trivial cause, yes, it may be a world of cause. And is there any other explanation? Okay. So, um, God of gods. So, remember that the, the, uh, the, the second is small g, g o d s, God, capital G of gods is in small g, uh, gods. So, uh, this so uh, this small g just represents everyone else who's got some sort of power and influence, but God is above all these small g's. So the small, so even kings, for example, kings and rulers sometimes are referred to as gods with a small g. Right? Uh, principalities and powers. Satan himself is referred to as a god of this world with a small g. So our god is above, god of gods, meaning he's god above all these small g's. You know, so, so whether it's human or demonic, that, and that's, that's how we understand. So god. Is God above gods? So God of gods it doesn't mean that these are also gods with Him. There are no comparison. It's just that He's God above all these small things, small gods. Thank you. Okay. So let's read chapter twelve. We're coming now, moving into chapter twelve. Uh, we just. Uh, it's a small chapter. Uh, we'll just read it, then go for a break, come back, and then study chapter 12. So uh, let's just read it, uh, you know, maybe three verses each. Uh, Revelation, uh, not Revelation, Daniel, Daniel 12, uh, the small chapter. Let's read three verses each, please, 1 to 13. At, the, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was with, never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting content. Yeah. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Amen. But you, Daniel, sh shut up the walls and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above Okay, um, not sure if we are able to hear. Um, so let somebody can somebody read from verse four onwards, please. Then I had a man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and saw by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, a time, a times and a half a times. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I had, I did not understand. Then I say, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Amen. And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked 
wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up there shall be 1290 days verse 12 onwards bless us who wait and arrive at the 1330 days but go the way to the end and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the day Amen. okay um yep thank you everyone um so let's um go for a break and we're going to come back and look through chapter 12 uh just to you know it's like the final message um wrapping everything up but it's also interesting because he's giving us additional time periods uh he's using some time period that we are familiar with a time times and half a time but he's also bringing in some other days which we haven't seen before that's especially in verse 11 and 12 uh, he's talking about days uh, and so we will look into those days and see what that means right so let's come back in uh, 11 o'clock uh, right after this break and we will go through chapter 12 thank you <laughs> 